Hi, I'm Carl Lewis, and this is the Bet Central Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the latest episode of Zach Lowy's European Football Show. We've got a great show for you today. I'm here with two Aston Villa fans. I've got Dan Bardo, a freelance football journalist and broadcaster who has worked for the likes of The Athletic and Sky Sports. It's a pleasure to have you on, Dan. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. About a year ago, if you'd have said we were both Aston Villa fans, we'd have probably been quite embarrassed. But actually now, yeah, feeling quite feeling quite good about that. And it is also a pleasure to have another Villa fan, Jonathan Johnson, a Paris-based correspondent for CBS Sports Golasso Show. If you want to stay up to date with all things Paris Saint-Germain in English, you need to be following this man on John Le Gossip at Twitter. Uh, absolute pleasure to have you on, Jonathan. How are you doing today? Yeah, doing very well, thanks. And uh, I might be Paris-based, but uh, my heart definitely still rooted at uh, a Villa Park. And as Dan said, great time to have uh, Villa fans on your on your show right now to to chat all things uh, Unai Emery and uh, and the villains. Jonathan, it's great to have you on because you do have a unique perspective uh, on Unai Emery, Aston Villa's manager, as of October after replacing Steven Gerrard. You covered Emery when he was Paris Saint-Germain manager, and now you are watching him manage your favorite team in Aston Villa. What has it been like to watch Emery's development as a manager? I mean, first of all, I'd say that I haven't been covering Villa as closely as as Dan would have been uh, since Emery came in. But obviously, I do have that sort of um, history of of having seen Emery uh, coach PSG up close and obviously have followed him, uh, you know, since he's left PSG and seen what he's managed to achieve throughout his career. And first and foremost, I'd say I'm not entirely surprised that his uh, impact of Villa has been positive. I am slightly surprised that it's been so immediate, uh, you know, and, and at this moment in time, you know, quite shocking when you compare Villa's start to the season under Steven Gerrard to how Villa are doing now under Unai Emery. It's, you know, it's night and day. Uh, but, uh, you know, everything that I saw from him at PSG and then some of his postings since uh, and even before PSG, uh, you know, should really have prepared us to expect this kind of impact from Emery. And personally, I think Villa is a really good fit for him because whenever Emery has had experience at what we would consider sort of elite clubs, you know, your PSGs, your Arsenals, the the expectations, rightly or wrongly, have, have always sort of gotten the better uh, of him, whereas he's done his best work at these clubs that are just slightly below, I guess, what you would consider sort of elite standing, uh, but sort of with big enough potential uh, you know, to become, you know, some of these kind of really established names that compete for trophies. I mean, you look what he's done in the Europa League, not just with Sevilla, uh, but afterwards with Villarreal as well. Uh, you know, and he had some fantastic performances and he managed to get some fantastic performances, sorry, out of the PSG side as he's doing now, uh, you know, with Villa. And to be honest, I think the most remarkable thing in all of this, and I know people have been raving about it for, for the last couple of weeks since Villa went on this uh, run of really impressive form. But I think one of the things that makes makes it so uh, worthy of praise is the fact that Emery has done this without any real preparation with the team. Okay, you could say that they had the uh, the World Cup break, but players did go away on international duty during that. And he's only been able to add really sort of one player that you can look at and say that's definitely uh, a signing that Unai Emery has stamped his approval upon. So times are already exciting enough at Villa Park, as Dan will attest in a moment or so, I'm sure. But it feels like there are really, truly some bright times around the corner for Villa for the first time in, in quite a long time. Aston Villa were 16th when Unai Emery replaced Steven Gerrard in October as Villa manager. They currently sit 6th in the league after a 1-1 draw against Brentford. Ivan Tony opening the scoring in the 65th minute, Douglas Luiz equalizing in the 87th minute for Villa, who have not lost since February 18th and currently sit 6th in the table, two points behind Tottenham Hotspur. Dan, talk to me a little bit about Aston Villa's transformation under Unai Emery. I think previously under Steven Gerrard, you would turn up to watch a game and you would not have you would watch Villa and think what have they done in training all week because they look like 11 strangers on a football pitch I think now 
you can see how much detail Unai Emery must go in go into. I know that there's very long video sessions that he that he sits in with the players, makes the players go through, which you know, Premier League footballers' attention spans, I imagine, isn't great. But I think he's had that absolute buy-in of everyone at the, at the football club and the players have enjoyed going from the the Steven Gerrard era to Unai Emery. And they, they're just galvanised by him. He, he's so, so insightful. He's, he's so, so tactical. In that first game against Manchester United, I think he'd had two training sessions with, with the players. And immediately they beat Manchester United 3-1 and just looked so much better that, than they had done for the previous parts of, of the season. They, they had a little bit of a stumble after, after football came back after the World Cup. But this last eight, nine games... I can't tell you how, how how good they are, how efficient they are. Even when they didn't play well at the weekend against Brentford, they've they've still managed to stay into the game, stay in the game, sorry, and and got themselves a point. And that's a sign of a good team when you're picking up a point when you're not playing well. Brentford's a really really hard place to go, and I think Brentford were were tactically very switched on at the weekend against Villa, made it very difficult for them. But he stuck with his he stuck with his methods. It's very easy to throw players on a bit like Arteta has done in recent weeks and completely dismantle your formation when you're behind in a game. And I always think managers do that. And I don't think it's always the answer. He stuck to his principles, stuck to his philosophy. Didn't throw John Duran on, on off the bench, and Villa have got back into the game. He's just tactically, he's the most fascinating manager I've ever watched at Aston Villa, and you can tell that all the players have completely bought in to to, to what he wants and to go on the run that they've gone on in the, in the Premier League and to think that they're sitting in six considering that the head start that they gave all the teams around them, I find it absolutely phenomenal because I knew he was going to be good for Villa. But like Jonathan, I didn't think it was going to be this quickly. I think something else I'd like to add as well on, on Dan's point, because it's something that I saw up close in Paris, is that um, you know ability to really pour over everything tactically. There was a fantastic press conference very early on in Emery's time with PSG. I think it was towards the end of pre-season or around one of the early games uh, in his first season in charge. And he did this phenomenal, it was like a presentation to, to all of the journalists where he got all of these water bottles on the table and was showing that different ways that he wants his team to be moving around, where he wants players to be when they're on the ball, when, when they don't have possession of the ball. Uh, you know, and it was unlike anything that I'd ever seen. I, I think the closest thing that I'd, I've seen to somebody with Emery's level of tactical understanding since him uh, in Paris has to be uh, Thomas Tuchel. I don't think really any of PSG's other uh, you know, managers since, not Mauricio Pochettino, not Christophe Geltier, have come close to, to Emery's ability to not only, um, you know, sort of live, uh, you know, sort of eat and breathe and drink, you know, football in the way that he does, but also... Um, you know, to, to come up with these different ways of, uh, of seeing it and, and managing to communicate with his players. Also, I think something else that was key to Emery sort of having this success now with Villa or, you know, being on this good run of form at the moment with Villa is he's very clearly gone away after his time with Arsenal, felt like he could maybe be more of a success in the Premier League in the future and has worked on the areas that he considers and that many other people have considered to be his weaknesses, namely his communication. And his communication from day one at Villa has been, you know, impressive for somebody who was so unfairly criticised, I felt, during his time with Arsenal. Unai Emery's arrival has helped to galvanise quite a few Aston Villa players, perhaps none more so than Ollie Watkins, wasn't able to find the back of the net against his former club Brentford at the weekend, but has nevertheless scored 11 goals in 2023. Only Victor Osimhen has more in Europe's top five leagues this year. Dan, talk to me a little bit about Ali Watkins' transformation under Unai Emery. From what I hear, I think a new contract is is quite close for, for Ali Watkins. I'd expect that to get signed in in the next few weeks. And the improvement, in, I think that's one of the biggest things with Emery as well. There was a few players that were being completely written off by, by the Villa fan base because they weren't performing under Steve and Gerrard. And you look now and you think that probably wasn't their fault. It was to do with the tactical setup. But I look at the improvement in Esri Konsa. I look at the improvement in Tyro Mings. John McGinn has been sensational for Villa in, in the last month or so. And Ollie Watkins, it just shows you what a good coach Unai Emery is because He's just subtly changed little things in Ollie Watkins' game. He's he stopped him doing r- running that he did, doesn't need to do. He's kept him playing more more in central areas and had him getting more shots away. And the thing that impresses me most about Ollie Watkins is when he has a shot, he normally hits the target 
And he scored a couple, a couple of goals that have come through bodies and that, that maybe keepers sh- should do better with. But it's because he always hits the target. So he, he gives himself a, a chance. He, he seems to thrive on being the, the main man as well. When Danny Ings was sold in January, I think there was a, a few Villa fans that maybe would have said, oh, we've got rid of the, the wrong striker here now. I actually think Ollie Watkins was having a good season with what he was given under, under Steven Gerrard. I think his hold at play, you could tell he'd worked on some things in, in the summer and I thought he was playing really well, but he wasn't getting the goals. Now, the goals are, are, are absolutely flowing and it's a surprise when you have a game at the weekend w- w- when he doesn't score because he just feels like he scores every, every week at, at the moment. But he's become a proper penalty box striker now. I think his all-round game has improved in the last 12 months. And when you're a team like Villa, I don't think you're going to get in a, a striker that offers you more than, than Ollie Watkins. Now, if anyone can work out what Villa's system is because it, it's so intricate, then then fair play because I, I can't tell you what formation Villa are playing at times. It's just so, so fascinating watching the off-the-ball movement. But as the number one striker, having that main guy, I don't think there's better for a team of Villa's level than Ollie Watkins. And Emery's had success in improving strikers before at the clubs he's been at, and he's done it again with Ollie Watkins. Unai Emery doing some fantastic things at Villa Park. We're going to be discussing a lot of Premier League action later on, so don't go anywhere but I want to discuss the action in Europe's uh, fringe leagues. So going to start off with Belgium. Gank were, cha- were crowned as regular season champions of Belgium, finishing level on 75 points with defending regular season champions Union saint gilois and advancing to the championship playoff alongside Union saint gilois Antwerp and Club Bruges, who defeated Upen 7 nothing to secure their place in the top four. Can Club Bruges somehow, some way? Uh, pick up a fourth straight league title. will be very interesting to see what happens there. Over in the Netherlands, we saw Feyenoord beating Utrecht 3-1, whilst PSV Eindhoven defeated Ajax 3-0. Those two teams are going to face each other in the cup final in the Netherlands. Feyenoord, though, currently 8 points above PSV and 11 above Ajax. Benfica bounced back from their Champions League elimination by beating Estoril Praia 1-0, whilst Porto also beat Passos de Ferreira 2-0, and Braga beat Casapia 1-0. Benfica remained four points clear of Porto and six points clear of Braga with five matches left. Benfica and Feyenoord both looking to end uh, their title droughts, and Benfica looking to claim their first Primera title since 2019. Moving on to Ligue 1 now, we saw... Quite a few interesting results. Lille fell to a 1-1 defeat at newly promoted Auxerre. Marseille beat Lyon 2-1 via an extra time own goal from Malo Gusto to move back into second place. Uh, Nice, they were the last remaining French team uh, in Europe until Thursday when they lost to Basel. They would follow up their Europa Conference League defeat by losing 2-1 at home to Clermont Foot, who leapfrogged Les Aiglons in the table and sit ninth. Despite losing top scorer Mohamed Bayo to Lille, Clermont Foot have followed up last season's narrow escape from relegation with a sensational campaign. Jonathan, how have Clermont Foot been able to punch above their odds in their second Liga 1 campaign in club history despite barely spending a penny? That's an interesting question. I mean, to be honest, not too many people kind of uh, ask about Clermont. They kind of fly under the radar a little bit, despite having some some decent players there, some decent talents, like you mentioned. Uh, you know, Bayo left uh, for Lille. Uh, and they haven't missed him too much. And I think, uh, you know, all of, uh, you know, what Clermont have been able to achieve, don't forget, they're pretty much guaranteed to be playing a third consecutive season of Ligue 1 football now, which is really impressive for a club that hadn't been in the top flight in France, uh, you know, certainly not in the modern era. Um, up until very recently. And I think so much of this is testament to the great work that Pascal Gestion has done. He's a very old school coach, uh, hasn't had the, the same sort of resources made available to him that other coaches have who have done worse jobs with arguably better squads. Uh, you know, and I think the reason why they were able to get up from Ligue 2, survive in Ligue 1, and now, you know, almost thrive really uh, in the top flight is because of the the continuity that they've got with the the staffing. And uh, actually, it's quite timely that we're talking about them because a couple of days ago, Gestian and his entire staff had their contract contracts extended for next season. So they're definitely going to be a, a, a team to, to keep an eye on. But I think with the rise of teams like Clermont, it makes it really interesting. I mean, especially if you are um, a club 
a little bit like a villa actually sort of looking for talented players who uh you know might or might not be playing in europe next season with their french clubs there's going to be a lot of teams a lot of very talented teams you mentioned nice earlier uh lille as well and you can add the likes of Lyon and ren to the conversation teams that miss out on qualifying for europe and put some very very talented young players uh on the transfer market because those players won't be waiting around for their clubs to get themselves back into europe they'll need continental action now and Personally, I think that Ligue 1 is going to have a really busy summer ahead of it um, in terms of transfers because there's going to be a lot of teams uh, you know, looking to, to pick up talent at a, a relatively reasonable price. We also saw 10-man Montpellier beat Rennes 1-0 at home via a goal from Steffi Mavididi. Lance beat Monaco 3-0 via a brace from Luis Openda and a goal from Adrian Thomasson. Whilst Paris Saint Germain beat last place Angers 2 1 via a brace from Kylian Mbappe, PSG currently sit 8 points clear of Marseille, 9 above Lens, and 14 above Monaco, and they look set to win their second straight Ligue 1 title this season. What are the sensations at the Parc de France with regards to the work that Luis Campos and Christophe Galtier have done this season? And what are the biggest positives and negatives from Les Parisiens' campaign? Well, you've given me a, a lot of questions that are going to receive negative. No, 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 but a lot of questions that are probably going to receive negative responses because overall, the verdict on what uh, Campos and Geltier have done with PSG so far is not exactly, um, you know, a, a terribly positive one. It's not exactly glowing uh, references that are that are coming back from what PSG have managed to do this season. Uh, Lionel Messi at this moment in time, it seems more likely that his future lies away from Parc des Princes than uh, at, uh, you know, in the French capital. Uh, Galtier himself, uh, you know, not just because of the recent controversy that flared up, but also uh, because of the fact that PSG got dumped out of the Champions League again, went out of the Coupe de France as well. All of this, uh, you know, is... Uh, you know, unacceptable really for for PSG what they've hoped to you know to 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 become this season that's starting to build around Kylian Mbappe hasn't got at all uh, according to plan, and it seems like we're going to be set for another summer of, uh, of of massive change because you know PSG, you know the minimum expected of them is to win the league on title. Yes, this season it'll be a historic one because it'll be their 11th, which means they're the all-time record holders in terms of Ligue 1 titles. But given what PSG aspire to win, that's not considered enough by PSG's leadership. So, uh, you know, I think we can expect them to make, uh, you know, wholesale changes, uh, you know, both to the squad and to the staffing. Uh, and to be honest, I don't think there's a guarantee that even Campos will be there uh, next season, let alone uh, Galtier. Uh, you know, it's well documented that players have disagreed with some of the moves that, that Campos has made. Equally, you could argue that they, PSG were hamstrung by the fact they paid so much to, to extend Kylian Mbappe's contract when he could have joined Real Madrid. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know there is arguably no greater star in world football at this moment in time than Mbappe. So it, it was a no-brainer for PSG to move to try and keep hold of him. Now they have to come good on their word uh, and build around him, which many feel, Mbappe himself, that wasn't the case uh, last summer. It's been another dismal campaign for Ligue 1 clubs in Europe, but it has been a stellar season for Italian clubs. Juventus going to be taking on Sevilla in the Europa League semi-finals, whereas uh, Roma going to be facing off against Bayer Leverkusen in the other Europa League semi-final. Inter will be facing off against Milan in the Champions League semifinals, and they'll be taking on either Real Madrid or Manchester City in the final. So we will see an Italian team in a Champions League final for the first time since 2017. Uh, And in the Europa Conference League, Fiorentina going to be taking on Basel. If they can win, uh, they will be facing off against West Ham or Az Alkmaar. Potential to be a really successful season for them in Europe. Fiorentina edged Lech Poznan to advance to the semifinals of the Europa Conference League, but would follow that up with a 3-2 defeat at Monza, their first loss in Serie A since February 12th. Torino beat Lazio 1-0 via a goal from Ivan Illic. Inter getting themselves a 3-0 win at Empoli in a match that would see Romelu Lukaku score a brace and Lautaro Martinez at another. Lukaku scoring an open play in Serie A since the 
first week of the season, and Inter getting themselves a 2-0 win against Lecce via a brace from Rafael Leao, having sprinted the entirety of the pitch and provided an assist for Olivier Giroud in their match against Napoli. Leao was decisive once again for the Rossoneri. That's now 13 goals and 12 assists for the 23-year-old. What makes Leao such a special talent, Dan? And where does he rank amongst the deadliest wingers in football right now? I was just thinking while you were talking, <laughs> Milan don't have an array of mobile forwards playing in front of him. It must be difficult to keep up with him at, at times because the, the way he carries the ball and the way he dribbles, he, he's, he's so, so unique. He, he's such a strong dribbler and he's he's turning into a really good finisher now as well. I, th- I think that's the, the big thing with him. He, he's getting that end product. He's been a player that's that's been around for, for a few years now, but it feels like now is his time, especially with the way that Milan have gone in, in the Champions League and they've got a very good chance of, of getting to the Champions League final and he'll be someone who'll want to showcase his talents at, at, at the highest level because he didn't get as much football as maybe he should have done in, in the World Cup and you know the, the last international break as well. I think he only played around 40 minutes across the two games. So he's not yet exploded on, on the international scene. That, that'll be the next step for him. Can he get himself into that Portugal side? And, and can he can he make it, establish himself in, in that team? But he couldn't have done much more recently for, for Milan. You know, he's, he's turned into a real big game player, player for them. I think he's still got things that he can work on with his game, but he's, he's such a unique talent and he's the kind of player that, you know, you'd pay to go in and watch him because... He's got bags of ability. He, he, he can get away shots. His finishing, as I said, has improved in recent seasons. And just the way he carries the ball and dribbles, he's so unique. Napoli bounced back from their Champions League elimination by beating Juventus 1-0 via a 93rd-minute goal from Giacomo Raspadori. Napoli currently sit 17 points clear of Lazio and are set to win their first Scudetto in 33 years. But Juventus nevertheless sit third after their 15-point deduction was suspended last week. Max Allegri's side sit two points behind Lazio, three above Roma, who have a game in hand and face Atalanta today three above Milan, and five above Inter. What do you make of the decision to revoke Juve's point deduction, Dan? And who are you picking to finish in Italy's top four? Serie A is is fascinating this year. I think what that point deduction did for Juventus, I think it almost gave them a little bit of a a siege mentality and they they kind of came together and started picking up some results under Allegri. I I don't think it's gone as they would have planned since he returned to the club. I don't think they've they've done as well as perhaps people would have thought that they would have done. And then it's weird, as 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 the points get given back to them, they lose, and it you know it felt like a decent time to to play Napoli with what happened with them in the in the Champions League in in midweek. But if you're asking me to pick a top four at the moment, I, I genuinely can't do it because there's a massive game tonight. We're recording on a, on a Monday. There's a massive game tonight, which is is going to be fascinating. Atalanta against Roma. You know, if Atalanta beat Roma, that pulls them right right into the mix. And then there's another team that you add in there that you think have got a good chance of of finishing in the top four, and that's something that they've done on, on, on a fairly regular basis in, in recent seasons. Roma were the ones that, that I was watching because since they lost to Lazio, that they, they bounced back and picked up a, a lot of good results. They've been keeping clean sheets. They they came from behind in the, the two-leg tie in the Europa League and got got themselves into the, into the semi-finals. But genuinely, if you're asking me to pick at the moment, I can't do it. I think the top two is is pretty pretty much there. They're, they're obviously going to finish in the top four. But after that, it could be any number of teams. I think Serie A has been fascinating this year. I think as well, to, to add on what Dan said, I think if any team looks better for Juventus having that uh, point deduction revoked, it's actually Roma. Uh, looking at what Jose Mourinho has done, since arriving there, not only for sort of his reputation post Tottenham Hotspur, but also, uh, you know, for for what he's managed to do with them in Europe as well, obviously winning the Europa Conference League, getting to a Europa League semi-final. It's really impressive that, you know, they could potentially be level on points with Juve still. Just uh, really adding to to, to what Dan said, I think Roma in particular, uh, you know, deserve, uh, you know, particular praise. It's, It's a bit strange to say, that there is a club that comes off looking quite quite good or quite well uh, since Juventus have had those points restored. But I actually think it's the case with Roma when you look that they're 
potentially within three points uh, of Juventus, despite Juve getting that you know 15 point uh, boost uh, and the fact that a good result against Atalanta for Roma, you, you know, could actually lift them level on points with Juve. This is obviously a Roma side where Jose Mourinho has has done his reputation in the world of good since obviously it was quite damaged after he left uh, Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, but to go there, to win a Europa Conference League, to take Roma to the, the semi-finals of the, the Europa League as well, uh, you know, I think he deserves recognition for the for the job that, that he has done, which I think, you know, sort of has put him back on the radar. I want to move on now to Germany. Uh, we saw plenty of action in the Bundesliga. Union Berlin won 1-0 at Borussia Mönchengladbach via goal from Geraldo Becker. Freiburg beat Schalke 4-0. And Bayer Leverkusen beat RB Leipzig 2-0. But the biggest shock of the weekend came in Mainz, with Sadio Mane opening the scoring for Bayern Munich after a half hour, only for Mainz to score three goals in 15 minutes and secure a 3-1 win. Having arrived on March 24th, Thomas Tuchel has already matched Julian Nagelsmann's tally of three defeats this season with Bayern out of the DFB Pokal and the Champions League and one point behind Borussia Dortmund. Jonathan, you covered Tuchel during his time at Paris Saint-Germain. What have you made of his start uh, to life in Bavaria? And what needs to change in order for him to reverse his nightmare start? I mean, first of all, I was surprised at the timing of Bayern's decision to replace Nagelsmann with Tuchel. I wasn't actually surprised about the decision itself. I do think that Bayern is a job that requires somebody with greater experience than Nagelsmann has. And that's not um, sort of doing down what he's achieved in the very early years of his career, because obviously it's very impressive. But I I think that Bayern, especially Bayern's dressing room, always commands somebody who's got, uh, you know, that, bit of extra pedigree which obviously Thomas Tuchel has you know having you know won the Champions League with Chelsea having led PSG to a Champions League final as well Uh, and I think uh, you know what I see in these early days uh, with Bayern similar to some of the struggles he had at times with PSG where he's inherited a number of problematic positions notably in attack um, and Bayern still suffer for failing to replace that prolific source of goals that was Robert Lewandowski Uh, but Not all of their problems can be chalked up to that. I think that there are some major sort of communication and tactical um, misgivings, notably in defence. You know, sometimes Mecano looks like a world beater. Sometimes he looks like, uh, you know, an amateur, uh, you know, who's who's turned out for a professional team. Uh, And, uh, you know, I do think that there is a big question over the attitudes of some players as well. We saw the sort of Mane on Sané. Uh, after the, the the Manchester City game in the in the Champions League, but there's also been issues sort of with Manuel Neuer when he got himself injured after the World Cup, that sort of thing. So I think Bayern are certainly a team in need of authority, which Tuchel does bring, but early results haven't helped him. Uh, and I do think that he is at risk at this moment in time, given that there seem to be, uh, you know, some some itchy trigger fingers at Bayern. Uh, you know, there's suggestions that Oliver Kahn will be replaced. Uh, there's question marks over Sally Hamasic and, and over Tuchel as well. I mean, understandable if you consider that this could end up being a trophyless season for Bayern, but equally a little illogical seeing that he's only just walked into the job. Um, so obviously a fight uh, on Bayern's hands now to to at least retain the Bundesliga title, but perhaps missing out on what was previously just considered a given uh, in terms of the Bundesliga is the wake-up call that Bayern need to make some deeper changes than just changing manager once again. Because quite clearly, if it's something that Nagelsmann and now Tuchel are struggling with, there's something perhaps slightly deeper rooted than, than many people think uh, You know that, that is causing some of the issues at Bayern. Last weekend, Borussia Dortmund failed to take advantage of Bayern's draw to Hoffenheim, taking the lead in the 92nd minute, only to concede five minutes later to Stuttgart. This time, however, uh, they followed up Bayern's uh, loss to Mainz by winning 4-0 at home against Eintracht Frankfurt and moving one point above Bayern, three above Union Berlin, seven above Freiburg, and nine above RB Leipzig. Jude Bellingham opened the scoring early on, whilst Daniel Malin added a brace and Mats Hummels also got on the score sheet. Dan, you had the pleasure of watching Bellingham play for your local rivals, Birmingham City. You've been able to watch him for the England national team. What have you made of his development at Dortmund, and how important is he going to be uh, for Eden Terzic's side as they chase their first Bundesliga title in 11 years? 
Yeah, apart from the team that he supports, he's almost the, the perfect <laughs> midfielder, isn't he? Yeah, there isn't anything that he doesn't do well. And to show so much maturity at his age and really to have become a huge, huge leader, but both for Dortmund and for England, actually, you can see in his recent England appearances, he's become a lot more vocal on the pitch and actually become a, a, a real leader there as well. I think it's massive for Dortmund that they've, for the, what feels like the first time anyway, that Bayern have dropped points and Dortmund have followed up and, t- and took advantage of that. I, I think that's massive. And if they're going to win this league, then then Bellingham will be a huge, huge part of that. And I actually think if, that, if they win the league, they've, they've got a hell of a chance of keeping him for, for another year, which would be massive for them because he's become that massive leader then. He's become a real talisman for, for Dortmund. And I, I just love watching him. As I say, you know, he's come from the wrong side, side of Birmingham, in, in my opinion, but he's a player that you can't fail but 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 like. And as much as he's associated with Birmingham City, I've got him on the back of, of one of my England shirts, which tells you everything that, that you need to know. He's such a superb footballer and he's he's just a freak. To be so good at, at the young age he is, he's absolutely incredible and, and testament to him. He, he's one of my favourite players to watch. Jonathan, I know you've got to uh, go uh, soon, but I just wanted to ask you one last question about another uh, another one of the most promising midfielders in Europe alongside Jude Bellingham, and that is Eduardo Camavinga. Camavinga has, has been very impressive, uh, both in midfield as well as left back this season, delivered a stellar display at the weekend against Celta de Vigo at left back, winning six tackles, completing six out of seven dribbles, and winning 12 out of 19 ground duels. He's shown in multiple positions for Los Blancos, who will play their first Copa del Rey final in nine years against Osasuna, and will also take on Manchester City in the Champions League semifinals. How important is Camavinga going to be uh, for Real Madrid as they look to close out the season with a cup double? I think it'll be hugely important. Uh, you know, uh, I think this newfound versatility that he has is very uh, interesting and important, not only for Real, but also for France. Uh, f- French football, if it has sort of any kind of weak areas at this moment in time, you'd definitely say it's the fullback positions, both on the right and the left side. So to see him recast in that role at times uh, is uh, is very impressive. Also, this kind of physical element that he's, yeah, he's added to his game as well. I also think that that's been quite noticeable sort of over the last uh, six to 12 months. Uh, but, you know, Camavinga, I think, is somebody who's growing into the role, uh, almost sort of being groomed, being prepared for the future, where at some point, uh, you know, in the next couple of years, logically, you will have Modric, you will have Kroos uh, sort of handing over the baton to the likes of Camavinga and also to Aurelien Chouamini as well, uh, you know, and what a, a midfield pairing to have, assuming that they do feature together in the middle of the park in the future. Uh, and if not, you know, Camavinga is, as he's proving at the moment, you know, quite an adept fullback as well. So I think to have that kind of versatility almost reminds me a little bit of Joshua Kimmich and how he started out at right back and then moved into midfield uh, obviously you know sort of Philip Lahm was uh, uh, you know the, the, the sort of original um, you know player to be morphed from a, a fullback into a midfielder but you know Camavinga is kind of doing that journey in reverse which uh, you know I find uh, quite fascinating and uh, you know if he continues on this current trajectory, uh, you know, I think he will continue to be a, an important player for Real Madrid in the near future. And let's not forget, many people were suggesting that it was maybe not working out for him at Real sort of earlier in the season. And then to see him, uh, you know, go on and, and be sort of playing this important role now as a, you know, a very valuable utility player, uh, you know, I think is is quite an underrated quality. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's all, all I've got time for, guys. But it's been an absolute pleasure. Love chatting Villa with Dan. And uh, thanks a lot for having me on, Zach. And I look forward to being on again soon. Jonathan Johnson, the number one Paris Saint-Germain uh, correspondent in English. If you want to stay updated on an absolutely insane club, as well as other things in Europe, you need to follow this, man. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on, Jonathan, and uh, definitely want to have you on again soon. Uh, Real Madrid picking up their fourth consecutive 2 nothing win via goals from Marco Asensio and Eder Militao. We also saw Real Sociedad getting themselves a 2-1 win against Rayo Vallecano. They sit six points above Real Betis and seven above Villarreal, both of whom lost this weekend. And they are well on pace to return to the Champions League for the first time in a decade. 
Uh, Barcelona won one nothing against Atletico de Madrid via a goal from Ferran Torres, giving Atletico their first league defeat since January 8th when they lost one nothing at home to Barcelona. So Barcelona all but certain to win uh, the La Liga title. Going to be a very interesting ca- end to the campaign in Spain. Want to move on now to England. We've got a lot of football to discuss in England, and we've got Dan here uh, to discuss these f- fascinating developments. Uh, Wrexham ended a 15-year absence from the Football League and earned promotion to League Two after beating Boreham Wood 3-1, whilst Manchester United edged Brighton on penalties to secure a berth to the FA Cup final, where they'll be looking to win their second domestic cup this season under Eric Ten Hag. They'll be facing a Manchester City team that has won 11 of their last 12 matches, the sole exception being a 1-1 draw at Bayern Munich that would see them equalize uh, via penalty from Joshua Kimmich and, and uh, winning 4-1 on aggregate to move on to the semifinals. City following up that draw at Bayern with a 3-1 win against Sheffield United via a hat-trick from Riyad Mahrez. They're going to be taking on their crosstown rivals in the FA Cup final and will face Real Madrid in the Champions League semifinals. Dan, is anybody capable of stopping this city team? In domestically, I don't think so. No, I think now it looks like they'll win the Premier League, and I, I would say they're obviously favourites for the FA Cup as well. Champions League, I'm still not sure. I still can't see past Real Madrid. I think they just absolutely know what they're doing in in, in that tournament, and I, they would be my pick to, to win the Champions League still. So Manchester City have it, have work to do taking on them in the, in the semi-finals of the Champions League. But dom- domestically, it all just seems to have fallen into place for them. I think they've almost become machine-like in the way they're churning out results now. And at the same time, Arsenal have, have started to drop off and, and started, started to draw games and, and lose points. Obviously, it could all change with, with the huge, huge game on Wednesday. But at the moment, it would take a brave man to, to bet against Manchester City because I just feel like they've come into form at completely the right time. Pep's kind of solved his fullback issue by not playing fullbacks in, in recent weeks as well, the way John Stones drops into defensive midfield. So Pep seems to have landed on a system now that's getting the best out of his players. They've got Diaz back. It felt like he wasn't playing much football at one point this season, but they're just, they're just ready now. I think, I think Manchester City will win the league and I think they'll win the FA Cup as well. Going to be a very interesting FA Cup final. In the Premier League, though, we saw Fulham edge Leeds United 2-1 via goals from Harry Wilson and Andreas Pereira. Crystal Palace drew 0-0 at home against Everton in a match that would see Mason Holgate sent off for the Toffees. Uh, and so, so we also saw some very interesting matches across England's top flight. Uh, been a great week for West Ham, though. They climbed back from a two-goal deficit and secured a 2-2 draw against Arsenal before beating Ghent 4-1 and moving on to the Europa Conference League semifinals where they will face off against Az Alkmaar. West Ham following that up with a 4-0 win at Bournemouth. They are six points clear of the bottom three with the game in hand, and they are through to a European semifinal for a second straight year. Dan, what have you made of the Hammers this season under David Moyes? They've been quite a strange team to watch, West Ham. I think David Moyes has done a really, really good job there over the past two seasons, got them punching above their weight, but he's done it in a certain way. And I, I just felt that in the summer... They moved away from the things that had made them a good side in, in Premier League terms in, in the last few seasons, in terms of the personnel that they brought in in the in the summer transfer window. You look at some of the, the bodies that came through the door, not necessarily players that suit David Moyes' way of, of playing football. And I think at times he struggled to, to, to bed those players in and at times as, as wanting to kind of go back to what made West Ham good. In, in, in the previous two seasons. We know that Europe can, can always be a distraction. And in fairness, they managed that really, really well last season. And they've, that they've not managed to do it as well this this season. But they've missed big chances at, at big times. You look at you look at Bowen's output, it's, it's not as much as it was in, in, in the previous season. They've always got the Declan Rice's future hanging over them as well. Although it always amazes me that despite all the speculation about Declan Rice's future, he just always churns out performances. He's, he's always at a six or seven out of ten at, at the very least. And again, like Bellingham, such a, such a unique player and someone that will go on to, to win big honours with, with with a different team in in the future. But they've been they've been a strange team to watch at times, West Ham. But I think David Moyes 
it kind of always have good season than a bad season with Everton. I think that's kind of what's happened with West Ham. They've had a difficult campaign, but he's when it could have got tough after that massive defeat against Newcastle, they've managed to negotiate their way out of it and navigate some positive results. So I think they did the right thing by sticking with David Moyes, but it would surprise me if there wasn't a change in the summer in terms of the, the manager coming in. I think you, you'll see Moyes move on in the summer. I think West Ham will look to go in a different direction, but he has been a really successful appointment for West Ham when you look at where they finish in the Premier League and what they've done in Europe. Absolutely. I do think that Moyes is going to be given the rest of the season, and he, I think that West Ham are well on track to stay up. Can they potentially end their season with some silverware? would be very interesting to see if they can uh, move on in the Europa Conference League. Last season, they lost to Eintracht Frankfurt in the Europa League semifinals. Last season, uh, Leicester City suffered defeat in the Europa Conference League semifinals to Roma. Leicester have gone from a deep European run to a relegation fight. They beat Wolves 2-1 at the King Power this weekend via goals from Kalechi Iheanacho and Timothy Castan, whilst Liverpool beat Nottingham Forest 3-2 via a brace from Diogo Jota and a goal from Mohamed Salah. Wolves currently sit one point above Bournemouth, five points above Leeds United, six above Leicester City and Everton, seven above Nottingham Forest, and ten above last place Southampton. Forest have now lost four in a row, six of their last seven, currently find themselves in the relegation zone, and they haven't won a single match since February 5th. Despite a massive transfer spend, they face an uphill task as they look to avoid relegation. Dan, what has gone wrong for Steve Cooper's side in the second half of the season, and what needs to change if they are to stay up? I've covered Forrest a, a few times in recent weeks. So I've been been to the training ground in the stadium, sp- spoke to the manager in press conferences in, in recent weeks. And the thing that struck me was that reading Steve Cooper, I kind of felt like they're about where he, he thought they would be. I, I still don't think there's a great panic at, at Nottingham Forest. Obviously, that, that they'll want to stay up. But at this point of the season... They're still still in with a chance now. I think there was some positives to take out the the Liverpool game in that the, they scored two goals and really in the end they were unlucky not to not to work, walk away with a point. I think just defensively all, all season. I mean, recently they've had a, a terrible run of injuries and they've had a lot of injuries all season in their defence. Not Nottingham Forest. They've had they've had injuries all over the park. I just think I still think Steve Cooper's done a really good job because it's it's difficult to amalgamate so many new players and. You felt like just before the World Cup and just after the World Cup that they they got it right and that they was he was starting to get the best out of them and he'd settled on a formation and and players but then they got a load of injuries again and the club felt like they had to act in January so he's he's had to go through everything again in the second half of the season that he had to go through after after the first transfer window of of trying to get new players settled and 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 they've struggled but. They're about where you would have expected them to be. I, I suspected they were offered where they are now at the start of the season knowing that they've still got a chance of staying up and, and getting Premier League football for another year, I think they'd have taken where they are right now. And if they can take the positives out of, it, out of that last game at, at Liverpool, and home games are going to be huge for them because I think they're at about 80, 85% of their points have, have been won at home. If they can just get their home form going again, they'll give themselves a chance of, of, of staying up. But I'm glad they've stuck with Steve Cooper because I think it's such a such a difficult job what he's had to do and all the new players he's had to integrate through the, through the season. So I'm glad they've they've stuck with him, but they definitely need to get a win soon because it has been a long time without one. The most lopsided result of the weekend came at St James Park. Newcastle bouncing back from their defeat at Aston Villa by thrashing Tottenham 6-1 in a match that would see the Magpies take a five nothing lead within 21 minutes. Newcastle have won six of their last seven and are on pace to return to the Champions League after two decades. And whilst they have spent heavily on the likes of Bruno Guimaraes and Alexander Isak, they have reaped the rewards of individual players who have made huge strides under Eddie Howe, such as Joe Linton, uh, Fabian Scherr, Jacob Murphy, who got himself a brace. Dan, I'm curious, should Eddie Howe be a candidate for manager of the season? Absolutely. If, if if they get Champions League football, then he's he's obviously a, a huge, huge contender. I think at some point with the investment at Newcastle, we, we expected them to be in, in this position, but I don't think anyone would have realistically expected them to be sat, sat in third uh, at this stage of the season. I would have had them sixth 
had to push it in my preseason predictions. That, but it just shows you what a great job Eddie Howe's done. And, you know, you touched on, on, on players there. He, again, has improved players that, that were already there and, and formed a real good team spirit. And players can come in and out the side. And wh- whoever's playing, they know their job. They know what they're supposed to be doing. I think they obviously got a really bad result last week at, at, at Villa Park. And they've, they've reset and gone again and gone at home again against Tottenham and absolutely blown them away. They've got Isak at the moment, who's one of the form players in the league. Gamares is just a class act. He's such a good operator. Probably not playing in his best position either, playing as a playing as a number six, but he just runs the game from that position for, for, for Newcastle. And all season, with the exception of that Villa game, they've been they've been really really good defensively. I think you know it was a good time to play Spurs, wasn't it? Spurs are obviously on on the floor at the moment, and in a season where Chelsea are sitting in eleventh, somehow Spurs have controlled to be the most embarrassing team in in, in London in, in recent weeks, which is is absolutely incredible given where Chelsea are. But Newcastle will get. Champions League football and that's probably a year or two ahead of schedule I think Eddie Howe has done a tremendous job there and he's he's done things that I wouldn't have expected him to be able to do when he was Bournemouth manager people always used to look at the defensive side of it and say well yeah he's got them playing nice football a nice brand of football but he's never sorted their defence out that's been the big thing for Newcastle they've been so so good defensively and when you've got the players at the other end that can that can hurt teams it's no wonder they're sat, sat in the top 3 so he he deserves a massive amount of credit and yes definitely a contender for manager of the season Newcastle currently sit third they've taken 59 points from 31 matches Manchester United 59 points from 30 matches Tottenham on the other hand they have taken 53 points from 32 matches Villa 51 points from 32 matches, Liverpool with 50 points from 31 matches, and Brighton 49 points from 29 matches. So shaping up to be a really fascinating uh, fight for Champions League football. Tottenham, you know, it does seem like this is the end of the road for them. Going to be very hard for them to get back into the top four. It's now two straight embarrassing defeats after losing 3-2 uh, at home to Bournemouth. I, I really do think that this has got to be considered a failure on Tottenham season. You know, they've been sent packing by Forrest in the League Cup, uh, lost to uh, Sheffield United in the FA Cup, lost to Milan in the Champions League, now looks set to miss out on top four. Dan, where do you go from now if, if you're Tottenham? You know, you've got a... An, a vacancy at the managerial position. You've got plenty of players who are in their prime, such as Harry Kane, who you know maybe have an uh, an, an unclear future. Where do you go from there? Are, are you going to try to keep Kane? Would you try to blow it up and and go for a rebuild? You know, how do you solve a problem like Tottenham Hotspur? I mean, everything I've just said about Newcastle, Tottenham, Tottenham are the opposite of that. Nothing feels aligned. No one is pulling in the same direction. I think yesterday's game could be the game where they lost Harry Kane emotionally and and mentally because he must be sat there thinking, I deserve better than this. I, I can do better than this. I'm one of the best strikers in, in, in world football and I'm, I'm at a team that isn't doing a single thing well, well at the moment. It's probably a, a missed opportunity in terms of that they got rid of Conte or, or they decided between them that, it, that Conte was going to be no more. And it's just been more of the same under Stiolini. You know, until yesterday, he'd been rolling out the same personnel in the in the same system. Credit to him, you know, well, not credit to him because it hasn't worked, but they, they've changed system yesterday and it's turned into a, an absolute disaster. He's tried something different. But I just look at that team now and... It's kind of at the at the end of its cycle, and if if I'm Harry Kane, I'd, I'd be with a year left on my contract. I'm desperate to get out and and try something else and, tr- and try and win some silverware in in my career because what, is he 29, 30 now, Harry Kane? This is this is his last chance. If he if he commits to Tottenham, there's absolutely no guarantees that they're going to turn this round and 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 move up the league again. They, I was reading an article earlier, and it's, it's right. They're paying now for four years of of really bad decisions since Pochettino left. They they haven't improved. You know, look, watch, they're playing against Kieran Trippier yesterday for, for, for Newcastle. Since he's left in 2019, have they had a right back that's better than him? No, that they haven't. And they're, they're just failing in every, in every aspect as a football club but at the moment. They've backed Conte heavily in, in, in the summer and they're now stuck with a few players that suit Antonio Conte but won't necessarily suit the next manager that, that comes in. It is a huge, huge job for someone to come in there and and get it right. And after the last few appointments, you know, 
our Spurs as a club capable of getting making the right appointment and making the right decision? I, I don't know, but I do think that Harry Kane, for his own good now, for his own career, he needs to look to get out. But with Daniel Levy, who knows, even with a year left in his contract, you couldn't possibly predict what Daniel Levy will decide is best for Tottenham. So it's one to keep an eye on. But at the moment, as I said, that they're the laughing stock of the Premier League. That first 20 minutes yesterday was abhorrent. That That is an absolute disgrace from Tottenham in that first half. Harry Kane, going to be turning 30 in July, has a year left on his contract. I, I'm with you there. I think that uh, this should probably be the final season that Kane stays at, at Tottenham. I think that Daniel Levy will certainly do everything he can to keep him at the club, but if I'm Kane, I'm certainly not signing a new contract. When you look at the fact that clubs such as Bayern Munich, uh, Paris Saint-Germain, Manchester United, a lot of clubs in the market for a top-class center forward. Kane would fit the bill for a lot of those clubs. I wonder even if he would consider a move to Chelsea. I know that they're not in a great situation right now, but the fact is he's one of the best strikers of this generation, and he has zero club trophies to show for it. I mean, why why would he sign a new contract? I mean, there's no doubt he he loves the club, but I think even if he were to leave, I think the Tottenham fans would 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 wave him off and understand what why he was going to leave. The big thing is the Premier League record. If he, he's obviously chasing that at the moment, if he can't get that move to a Premier League team, I don't think he would go abroad because I think he will want that legacy and he'll want that Premier League record, especially when it, when it's in touching distance. I wouldn't rule out Newcastle as a potential Ooh. suitor for him in the summer. If they were to get Champions League football, bearing in mind the last person that broke the record was Shearer as well, I wouldn't completely rule that out. It would it would a little bit go against what Newcastle have done in the, in the previous windows. They've been a lot more measured than I would expect them to be. But I just think Harry Kane, he, he needs that move. And Manchester United, I think, are, st- are still the, the, the most likely one to, to take him. Chelsea are a basket case club themselves at the moment. You go there, there's no guarantee of success but you just feel for Harry Kane personally the year he didn't go to Manchester City and then they didn't buy a striker and bought in Haaland 12 months later he'll probably be be looking at that now and regretting it a little bit I would think you think that him and Alexander Issa could potentially coexist I think Newcastle would have to have two strikers I'm not convinced Callum Wilson will, will be there next season if they're to, to be competing at the highest level in the Champions League and, and the Premier League you know Kane would be an upgrade to, to Callum Wilson obviously I do think Isak can play wide I do think if Newcastle is playing the Champions League as well you might see a bit of tactical flexibility in terms of of changing the system a little bit maybe going th- three at the back and playing two up front I wouldn't rule that out I'm not saying it's going to happen or that I've got any information ar- around it at all but I wouldn't. I wouldn't rule it out if, as if if Newcastle get Champions League, that's now opening a completely different market for them, and they're obviously a club on the up, whereas the club that Harry Kane's at at the moment are, are purely on on the way down. So I do think it's one to keep an eye on. Harry Kane has two hundred seven goals. Uh, Wayne Rooney two hundred and eight goals, and Alan Shearer currently at the top with. 260 Premier League goals. I do think that he's chasing his record. It's interesting because, you know, I think that Levy would definitely not sanction a move to uh, United or Chelsea. It's going to be certainly a, a, te- a teeth and nails battle uh, between them over the next few months. Would Kane consider uh, abandoning his, his search to become the all-time Premier League top scorer and move to a club? like Paris Saint-Germain or Bayern, you know, is he going to potentially run down his contract? Uh, You know, could he do something similar to Robin Van Persie saying that, look, I'm not going to sign a new contract. You can either sell me or lose me on a free next summer. And, uh, you know, they would be forced to part with him. It'd be very interesting to see what happens. But yeah, I think that if I'm Harry Kane, there's no way I'm making the same mistake twice and signing another contract at Tottenham. Right now... Uh, just about the only reason for optimism, shall we say, the only reason for happiness amongst Tottenham's fan base is the recent form of their North London rivals, Arsenal, 
Arsenal falling to a third consecutive draw in a match that would see Martin Odegaard and and Bukayo Saka score late goals to salvage a draw at home against last place Southampton. The Gunners are five points ahead of Manchester City, who have two games in hand, and they need a major turnaround as they prepare to take on City at the Etihad on Wednesday. That's a must-win game for them. After after leading the league table for the entirety of the season, Mikel Arteta's side are in grave danger of losing out on the title to the Citizens. Do Arsenal have what it takes to weather the storm and stave off the pressure from the defending champions? I'd love to sit here and, and say yes, because I think Arsenal have been really, really refreshing this season. I think it's been good for the Premier League, the way Arsenal have done things and the fact that they've managed to to keep the pace for the, for the whole season. But they've just hit a few stumbles at the wrong time. I think Saliba, as, as him being out, has been a huge, huge miss. No disrespect to Rob Holding, but there is a... There is a massive drop down from from Saliba to, to holding, and you know, that back five, including the goalkeeper, had pretty much been together for the for the entirety of of the season. And if one player drops out and someone else has to come in, it, it's always going to have an an effect. Perhaps you drop a little bit deeper than you than you would do in in, in previous games. Communication becomes a problem because it's it's not the same five that have been there that the whole season. You you almost become one, you become become in sync when you're playing every single game. So even just one player being out can have a huge, huge impact on the side. And I, I really think that's that's what's happened to, to Arsenal. Credit them because they were three one down at the uh, on Friday night against Southampton and they got themselves back in the game. The the team spirit's there. Every, everyone's on board with each other. Everyone's playing for Arteta. Everyone's playing playing for the badge but just at the wrong time a few things have started to go wrong I think they've leaked goals in the second half of the season especially at home and it's now could that's now come back to bite them and Saliba not being there I think has, has has added to that so there's that little bit of fragility and that little bit of frailty at, at the back now which has started to started to cost them and they're kind of playing Man City at the, at the wrong time now aren't they Man City are on, on a huge huge run at the moment look look completely unbeatable in every game that, that they play that game earlier on in the season at the Emirates as well that they lost. You look back at that now, if they could have just taken a point from that game, that would have been huge in in, in the grand scheme of things. So it's just the the wrong time for them to be facing Manchester City at, at the Etihad. And I just can't see them beating them. I, I can't even see them taking a point at the moment, which is a shame because whatever happens, they've had an excellent season. It seems that they will be facing off against Manchester City without William Saliba and uh, as we've seen recently, frankly, it seems that going from William Saliba to Rob Holding is kind of like going from a Ferrari to a 1995 Ford Fiesta. Um, I, you know, to take one player who's that important uh, out of the team and bring in a player who just simply isn't uh, isn't good enough to be starting for a Premier League side. It's it's something that's very unfortunate for Arsenal. And, you know, in general, they've been able to play with the same players, have kind of a, a thin rotation, and, and not have the flaws of their uh, thin squad be exposed. But they're certainly coming to the fore recently. So, you know, I, I do hope that they can at least avoid an embarrassing performance. I, I think that they've been so good this season, uh, may not win the league title, but yeah, as you mentioned, it has been a positive campaign for Arsenal, even if it may end with no silverware. But the Premier League title race, it may very well come down to Wednesday's match between City and Arsenal. What do you feel are going to be the biggest make or breaks for Arsenal as they face off against City? And how would you approach this match if you're Arteta? Obviously, uh, he can't go into the lab and and completely solve uh, Saliba's injury. But you know, how would you approach this tactically? Would you be bringing in Leandro Trossard? Would you be moving to a formation? What do you think Arsenal need to do in order to turn around their form against City? They've got to tighten up at the back. I think on the face of it as well, Tommy Asu being out is probably a, a blow because maybe. He would have come in and, and played right back and they'd have shifted Ben White across and then he's playing next to Gabriel and that's exactly the centre-half partnership that they had last season. So I think if they're struggling down that, that side at the moment and they're, they're coming up against Jack Grealish, who is in the form of his life in his, in his Manchester City career. He's been one of their most crucial players in, in, this, in this title run. I just don't think they can stop Manchester City. I, I don't think there's anything they can do that, that will stop Manchester City at the moment. When, you, when you're looking fragile at the back as well, 
the last person you want to be coming up against is, is Erling Haaland. I think Gabriel suddenly looks like he's carrying the, the weight of the world on, on his shoulders when, when, when he's playing for Arsenal at the moment, whereas he's, he's had a really good season up, in, up until the, the, the last few games. I'm really not sure there's anything they can do to stop Manchester City at the moment. I think, unfortunately for Arsenal at the moment, they're just the stronger side. Manchester City, they're they're carrying the momentum as, as well. They've got they've got pretty much a full squad to, to choose from. And Arsenal should should they play Trossard? But then you'd probably have to lose Jay, Jesus f- f- from your team, which I'm not sure that they'll want to do. And Jesus will certainly want to play against Manchester City, play, playing against his, his his old club. But if they're to get anything. They've got to pick themselves up defensively. They've been making a few, few too many mistakes recently. Ramsdale, I think, has let in a few goals that he shouldn't have let in since that wonderful display against against Liverpool, where he made that that game changing save at the end of the game. I think individual errors are starting to creep into their game. But if you've got uncertainty in your ranks, like I said, the last thing you want to do is be coming up against against Manchester City, who just have got players in in sensational form at, at the moment. It's it's a tough ask. I just, I just can't see them taking a point, even unfortunately. Last but certainly not least, uh, Dan, what is your prediction for this game? Probably a three-one to, to Manchester City. I think I think that's what I'd go with them. I think Arsenal Arsenal will score. I think you know that you can, if, if you play in the right way, you can get at, at Manchester City. But that feels like it was something that was happening more in the early stages of the season in recent weeks. I think they've, they've tightened up their game. Yep. Edison's made some some good saves in, in recent weeks. I don't think perhaps he was having the best season up, up until recently. But they're, they're just so, so good all over the park at the moment. Haaland, you can't see him not scoring against this Arsenal back line. Uh, at the moment, Cross is coming in. Uh, yeah, I think 3-1, 3-1 to Manchester City, unfortunately for Arsenal. I can't see them doing anything on Wednesday. I'm going to go with 4-2 to City. I think that... Uh, it's it's very hard to see Arsenal even getting a point, frankly. City just look like the most dangerous team in Europe at the moment. And unfortunately for Arsenal, it seems that all of the criticisms that we've uh, levied on them over the, the past few years are, are really coming to the fore uh, in recent weeks. You know, I think that the lack of mental composure... Uh, perhaps, and and just becoming a bit too complacent in key moments. It's really starting to see uh, that pressure, you know, definitely take its toll, whereas City, they've been there, done that. They're used to winning the title. They know how to comport themselves in these kinds of situations. Uh, I do think that Arsenal will be back. I don't think that this is going to be a one-season wonder. Apart from their midfield options, pretty much all of these players, whether that's, you know, Ben White... Uh, Gabriel Jesus, Bukayo Saka, they're merely approaching their prime. They're only going to get better. So I, I think that Arsenal are going to learn from this. But yeah, unfortunately for the Gunners, uh, I think that this is City's title to lose at this point. And I, I think that City are going to turn the tide and get themselves a win against Arsenal on Wednesday. But uh, without any further ado, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you so much to Jonathan uh, Johnson for coming on. And Dan, it was an absolute pleasure to have your insight on. Uh, Feel free to plug anything. uh, Let the people know where they can find you or check out your content. Uh, Yeah, uh, I'll pop up in in various places, to to be honest, through the season. It's been mainly the athletic and Sky Sports news for me through the season, but always giving my football opinions on Twitter at, at Dan Bardell. That's probably the best place to, to find me. And then you'll see what I'm popping up on th- through the week. But yeah, really enjoy coming on. Thank, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's nice to talk about the the bulk of my work is is Premier League, so it was nice to talk about some some European football as well and talk about Serie A because I'm a, a lot of my family's Italian, so I've, I've always carried an interest in the league. So it was, it was nice to come on and do something different. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on, Dan. Ciao. And uh, I hope to have you on again soon.